This is vinegar. Uh huh. We we use it to cook, and we some people drink it. Have you guys ever had that uh, that strong apple cider vinegar with the Mother Earth or whatever it's called? You know where it has all the chunks and stuff in it. You know what I'm talking about? It burns no. your throat. Oh my gosh, it burns your throat bad. <laughs> but anyways, it's supposed to be really super good for you. Huh. Uh, like everything that tastes bad is. It's supposed to. Anyways, so you guys have all drank this before, right? Right? Vinegar? Has anybody here not drank vinegar? Have you had pickle juice and had vinegar? Yeah. No? Okay. Well, then this is bleach. Uh-huh. Okay. Bleach you don't want to drink. Just something that you, uh... And you better drink some bleach. Probably a bad decision. Bad decision. Um, <laughs> you I use it to clean our clothes. <laughs> right? <coughs> we use I, it to clean our clothes. Yeah. Well, but does anybody know what happens when you mix the two? Uh, yep. Yeah. Chlorine gas. Uh, it, uh... No <laughs> muy bueno. Yeah. If you inhale, it's a owie. So, um, this is just an example of how sometimes it's not necessarily that something's bad, but but in combination with something else, it becomes bad. Uh-huh. Okay, and so for instance, we'll be looking at money in the next couple couple weeks. I'm under the opinion that money itself is not bad. No. But the problem is, is that we there's something in us that when when, when money gets a hold of us, it. Huh. It changes us and it works. It's almost like the money has a mind of its own. You know what I mean? It just it doesn't take much to corrupt us. But with that being said, I still think that that other factor, that bleach in the equation that makes it dangerous, is us. Right. Um, the author of the book, um, Foster, what's his name? Foster something Foster. Anyways, that wrote the book that that we're taking a lot of this lesson, these lessons from. Um, the challenge of the discipline life. <coughs> um, he he claims, in his opinion, um, that money itself is what's called a power. In other words, um, money itself is is demonic, and you have to overcome it, just like you would anything else, like temptation, um, or I mean, like sexual temptation, stuff like that. Um, I don't really agree with him, but I definitely understand what he's saying. And throughout the course, I, I'll try to kind of show you what he says and my contrasting opinion mm-hmm. to kind of let you decide for yourself. Um, I uh. believe that the bleach in the situation is us. He believes the bleach in the situation is the money itself. Mm. So I gave you this example so you uh. could understand what I'm saying. Or with sex. Well, no, he doesn't really use the same thing with sex. So, um, okay. Uh. So before we get into the actual ideas of the three ethical themes, I wanted to show you how Oftentimes, greed gets into the church, but we call it something else. Uh, you know what I mean? And for the example, is I wanted to use the prayer of faith, where people think that they can actually ask, and, and we've talked about this to great uh, lengths already, but where, where Christians think that they can just pray and ask, and God will instantly give. Uh, uh, it's called the prayer of faith. Basically, <coughs> through your faith, you can become a millionaire. <laughs> you know, you can get all these different really cool things and everything. <laughs> and uh, one example of this that has trickled down into the church throughout the years is the idea that we're going to have a mansion in heaven. Um, I know I've, I've heard this all growing up. And it, even if you listen to Audio Drone, they had that one song um, about Father's House. Mm-hmm. And you can kind of see that it... it yeah. And you mm-hmm. can see that um, it kind of... I want to say alludes to the idea of we all get a mansion, but it doesn't really necessarily say that. And then there's a hymnal that says, um, you know, a harp, a home. Mansion over the hilltop. Yeah, mansion over the Yes, yes, mansion over the hilltop. Yes. Um, Basically, the idea of the song is, you know, this life sucks, and I'm okay with it sucking as long as, in the end, I get my mansion. It's basically the idea of the song. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, you can go look it up on the internet. I'm sure there's a co- I'm sure there's a, a recording of an old person singing it. Singing it. Um, and it's just an example of something that's trickled into the church of how greed has been master- masqueraded as, hey, this is okay as greed because we've spiritualized it. Mm-hmm. And so then it goes down throughout the generations, and nobody questions it because it just seems like 
Hey, that seems like a good idea. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So let's read the actual passage where this originally came from. It's in John 14, starting in verse 2. And this is what it says uh, in the ESV. In my Father's house um, are many rooms. If, there were not, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may also be. Now, in the King James Version, how, how it was translated was, in my, in my Father's house are many mansions. And the reason why is because the word that was translated mansions in the King James, which, by the way, isn't translated mansions throughout the scripture. On that there. Anyways, um, was translated as mansion is more dwelling place. Um, if you think of uh, in the Old Testament law how it talks about God's dwelling place, think of more of that. Okay. Um, obviously, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, not Greek. But I'm just trying to give you the idea of what it's saying. Um, so, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. So this could be translated or rendered rooms. That'd be okay. But mansions, that's a little bit of a that's a little bit of a leap. Um, and so once again, and, and this is something so poor, poor Bible translation, and then passed on through the generations, and Christians say, hey, it's okay, because it's a spiritual greed. See what I mean? We don't want anything to do with the fact that we're going to be dwelling with the Lord of everything, the God who created everything. We care that we have our mansions, that we're paid back for the harm that has come on us that has been so very unfair. See what I mean? Uh, uh, uh. Um, or once again, with the prayer of faith. Where, fa- where prayer and even faith are now weapons to use against things so that we can profit from it mm. rather than seeking the Lord. See what I mean? How it becomes twisted and manipulated to, to something that it was never intended to be used with. And pastors talked about this a lot, so I don't really feel the need to go too much into that. Um, and also, I have talked about it a lot, too. Um, and I don't go to youth groups, so I don't know if you've <laughs> um, so the idea here is do not accept beliefs and practices simply because they are familiar to you throughout the course of throughout the next couple months we're going to be looking at a lot of different things that I'm sure you've heard one thing or another about um, uh, the use of money why why we have money masturbation is it wrong or is it not wrong um, uh, divorce is it okay is it not okay is, does it exempt you from ministry in the future um you know, all these different things that, that you may have heard one thing or another on throughout the course of your life. What about authority? Whose authority am I under? Whose authority was I under? What if my parents got divorced? Whose authority am I under? See what I mean? A lot of different things like that where people are, are, are not quite sure what to believe. Um, and a lot of times people just kind of say things that sound good without actually giving the Bible to back it up. You know what I mean? And so it just kind of uses that to grind it into people. And we kind of get used to that. And once again, greed is a great example of how it masquerades itself as something better in Christianity, but it's still just greed. What? Oh. Um, So this is, uh, on your sheet it says, what is compartmentalized living? Mm -hmm. I I know it says an example of masquerading Christianity. I, uh, I actually gave you two. The prayer of faith and the mansions, so. Um, but anyways, um, I have on your sheet what is compartmentalized um, living, and this is a diagram of what that what that is. If you look on the left, you see a bunch of little circles, and those circles can represent really whatever you want it to: your job or a hobby, um, or your family, or uh, really whatever whatever things are important to you, um, your finances, whatever. Put those in those little boxes, and then the cross represents Jesus. He's just one of those things in your life. It, it's it's compartmentalized living. Okay, you take on, you, you put on your Christianity for things like going to church and you know taking communion and that kind of stuff. But then when it comes to the day-to-day life, Christ is um, ostracized from that living style. And as we look at um, at the, um, discipleship and with these three ethical themes, especially, um, we we're, we're really going to see the the importance of not com- compartmentalizing uh, these ideas. If you look on the right, this is more of the, the example of, of how the Bible shows us how to live. Jesus is the center of everything, and everything in your life flows through Jesus and flows to Jesus, okay? So your job, you're acting like a Christian there, right? Your finances, you're acting like a Christian there, right? Your sexuality, you're acting like a Christian there, right? 
See what I mean? All these things have to have Christ as the center. Which means that for these answers, we're going to have to seek God in prayer, and we're going to have to study the Word. Because, like, I'll give you an example. Is it wrong to notice someone is, intra- is attractive? Is it wrong to masturbate? Is it wrong to... See what I mean? These are hard questions that, that a lot of people have gotten a lot of different answers on. And so we need to take each of these different questions that we're going to have in the future and compare it with this chart. Am I ostracizing Christ from this area of my life based on something I don't like or something that I feel like or something I think like? Okay? Um, does anybody under, has there anybody have any questions about that? You guys understand what compartmentalized living is? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, one thing is that Christians must live faithfully. The world desperately needs to see Christians who live faithfully. Um, what the world sees now is it sees a lot of people who call themselves Christians that just live out anger. They pick at funerals, they say a lot of hate speech, they, they disagree with everything, um, you know, with homosexuality, and they're all, you know, just mean people, right? That's what the world sees. Or they see people who, like, was on that Jesus Freak album back in the, what was that, in the 90s, I guess? Um, about how people see. People see Christians as, I'm going to go to church, and that's going to be good enough, and I'm going to convict everybody else for what they're doing, but I'm not really going to have a change in my own life. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, then people outside the church always say things like this. Well, what does it matter? Because Christians are getting divorced just as much as people in the world. So evidently it's not making a change. What does it matter? People in the church are are doing this and just as much as people in the world, what does it matter? See what I mean? Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of questions that people have. And foremost, Christians must live faithfully. The world wants to see a Christian that is actually faithful to something. See what I mean? It's like there's a movie called Serenity. It's a science fiction movie. It's one of my favorite movies. Oh, yeah. And um, there's this part where the, where the shepherd or the um, chaplain, whatever, he's dying and he, and he talks to the captain. And he says, I don't care what you believe in. Just believe in something. You know, and oftentimes... That kind of echoes true for the church, too. We don't really believe in anything. We go through the motions, and we kind of get the idea, but we're not really faithful to things. Do you know what I mean? Um, we kind of like to have a place where people look up to us. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We don't actually like to do the legwork. And I'm not just talking about you guys. I'm talking about us as Christians. Right. We as Christians struggle with this. So what people want to see in Christianity, and not what people want to see, yeah, ugh. What people want to see in Christianity is faithfulness, and that's what they need to see, too. But also, what we need to have in our life is disciplined living and purpose in our living. Because if you live a disciplined life, that's good and all, but if you don't have a purpose for why you're living a disciplined life, eventually you're going to stop living that disciplined life. Whereas, if you have purpose in your life and you have no discipline, you're going to know what you're supposed to do, but you're not going to have the care and the follow-through because you're going to live a very undisciplined life. See what I mean? So what we need is a balance of discipline and purpose. Uh-huh. And so we're going to look at discipline over the next couple of weeks, and then I'll pre- pepper it through with purpose. So I asked this question. Did anybody prepare an answer? How do you overcome greed? Did anybody prepare an answer? No? Uh-huh. Well, I was, I, I've been thinking about it. Okay. And Anything that you want to share? Because this is going to be a recurring question. I was thinking more like, when I was thinking greed, I was thinking more money greed. That's fine. Um, I, I personally think the way you can overcome money greed is by <coughs> giving money. Okay. You know, it's, I, I feel like it's the same like when you hate someone, you pray for them and you start to, you know, have a love for them, you know. Just like with greed, if, if you have a problem with being greedy with your money, if you start giving it away and seeing the effects that it happens, you start liking to give your money away, not being so greedy with it. It takes a while sometimes, though. Like okay. I was going to ask a question, but I think I'll wait. Does anybody, anybody else have a prepared comment? Ben? Is that? Um. Is that you it's trying to think of a think of a comment? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, okay if you don't. It's going to be a recurring question. Well, I, the question, you know, how do you overcome greed? It depends on your perspective and.
how it pertains to that person. Or like, what do you mean? Uh, if you have a problem with a certain thing that you're greedy about, it's gonna until you learn to oh, uh, to figure out a way to don't let it take charge of you, mm. it's gonna. Right, and that brings us to the question, how do you overcome greed? And I was more talking about money, you, you were on the right perspective, but it's okay to yeah, give yeah, us yeah. examples and other yeah. things too. Just that it, it also um, depends on that person and the experience of that person, how he or she uh, views life. Mm. To the world view again. Yeah, you know, or just the typical, his perspective their perspective. Okay. Okay, anybody have any other comments or questions? We're good? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, so we'll keep looking at that question throughout the next couple of weeks. How do you overcome greed? Because it's kind of a loaded question. Yeah. Um, so I introduced these before, just wanted to kind of bring them back up because we'll be talking about them <coughs> over the course of the next few weeks. Um, the three ethical themes that we're going to be looking at is money, sex, and power. And they're all very much so intertwined. Um, and, and they're also used for each other. For instance, money is used to gain sex, but it's also used to gain power. Because if you have money, you have power, right? Uh -huh. But if you have power, you can also use it, see what I mean? Right. To, uh, <laughs> see what I mean? To get sex. And you see what I mean? It's all, they're all kinds of intertwined, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, these three things actually... Um, Will will keep resurfacing in your life. And one example of that is is in marriage. It resurfaces itself. Oh, yeah. um, it becomes an issue between you and your spouse of who's going to have the power in the relationship, right? Uh -huh. Whose uh, sex becomes more of a weapon than a tool. Uh -huh. It no longer binds the two together. It is something that's used to tear them apart. Yeah. Um, uh, and then money, you know. Um, who gets to decide where the money goes? Why do they get to decide? Once again, going back to the power thing. Uh -huh. See what I mean? Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden, you're not going to let me go buy my dress that I want? Well, then I'm not going to give you sex. See what I mean? And it becomes this power struggle between... Yeah. The, exactly, yeah. A power struggle between the two partners. And um, a great example in marriage. But this also is true in other areas of life, too. Marriage isn't the only one. I just wanted to give you an example. Um, but then there's also private world and social world. Uh -huh. and, and they kind of relate differently in, the, in each. Um, like, for instance, masturbation isn't going to come up a whole lot in the social world unless you're going to, like, public parties where public masturbation is, like, a thing. But that's kind of gross. Yeah. So I hope that your own conscience would bear witness against you on that one. Uh -huh. And everyone's going to plow through on that one. Um, so th there's, the diff there's the different private and social implications. Um, one example is how in the private world there, there's money, there's your finances, right? But in the public world, in the social world, there's business, there's success. Yeah. It's not just money, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's the business world, it's the competitive air, it's trying to do better, trying to one-up, my kid's better than your kid, my job's better right, than your kid, right. my oh, car's right. better than your car. Huh. Uh, my, you know, all these different things, it, it becomes, it becomes a, a um, try to take, 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 it, it's money everywhere, see what I mean? Um, as uh, as sex, the the social uh, development of that would be the marriage, the more serious relationship, the uh, the long term dating. What is it called? Where you're married to someone, but not by law, not really. What was it called? Common law. Common law. Yeah. Common law marriage. That kind of stuff. The more long term um, idea there. Um, and obviously, marriage is definitely a power play. Um, why would homosexuals care right. if they could marry if it if it didn't mean anything? Marriage does mean something. See what I mean? Um, yeah, and uh, so sex is more in the private world, but in the in the, in the more uh, social implication, it, it goes beyond just the sex of it. It goes beyond. It, it goes into the um, interconnection of two people in a very um, uh, very intimate, very intimate way. Um, and also, if you notice, marriage has the ability to unify two people closer than than anything could be, and also it has the potential to divide two people farther mm -hmm. apart than, it, than they could have been otherwise. So, I mean, uh -huh. marriage is a very, very powerful force, and uh, it shouldn't be taken lightly, you know, and, and, and it is a very very serious thing. Uh, power the, is, is the more private world, but then how does that relate into the more social world? Um, government. 
Mm-hmm. Government is our is the power over us, right? And people always have power struggles with the government, don't they? Um, we don't think this is fair, so we're going to rebel against it. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, is doing this a lot in, in the killing of police officers. I'm not commenting one way or another. I'm moving right past it because I'm not going to open up that can of worms. <laughs> I'm just showing an example of how they were rebelling against authority. Mm-hmm. Um, people who lie on their taxes, once again, a power stroke. So there's this, there's this constant, there's this, there's this constant um, throughout everywhere in our life. There, there's this, there are these three ethical dilemmas that keep coming up and resurfacing in different ways with different faces, different masks. See what I mean? And it's not always as easy to justify or not. I'll give you an example. You smuggle Bibles into a country that doesn't have access to Bibles because of government restrictions. And then when asked by, by a government official, you lie about it. Is that right or is that wrong? See what I mean? It's not so easy, is it? Well, lying is bad, but I guess getting the Bibles in is good, but the government is in power, not me. See what I mean? Uh-huh. In the real world, there is no easy answer. There's a whole bunch of gray. And it's hard to find your way amongst all this gray. And that's what we're going to be looking at. Looking at. Um, and also another common misconception is that the problem will be resolved by simply getting the right people for the job. Mm-hmm. If we get the right leaders, we surely we can have a handle on money if we just we just get the right person to handle the money. Right. right? Mm-hmm. But that's completely naive. It doesn't matter who is the right person. It's never going to, going to resolve the issue because the issue is the three dilemmas. The three things there. Money, sex, and power. And they keep resurfacing. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter who you are, if you are the right person or not. There's always going to be that element where it tears down the possibility based off of, you know, us. I call it the human factor. Mm-hmm. That no matter what it is, once humanity is introdu- introduced, it will huh. have changed the factors more than you could ever imagine. Um, <clears throat> and so once again, the problem is not going to be resolved by getting the right people. Um, if we get the perfect president, once they are in that position of power, already the equation changes. Uh-huh. See what I mean? Let's say we have Good Samaritan Joe. He doesn't have power. But now we're going to put him in a place of power, the president, right? Uh-huh. Already the equation has changed, which means the outcome is going to change. And because people never stay the same, something is going to change, uh-huh. for good or for worse. For better or for worse, I mean. Do you see what I mean? Right. There's always unchecked challenges that we have to face with these two things. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter about getting the right person. It comes right back to the same question, how do I handle these three things? Right. And everywhere in your life, it's going to keep resurfacing and keep resurfacing in different ways and different, different ways of getting its fingers into your life. You know what I mean? And so the only way to really move forward is to know how to conquer them. Do you see what I mean? How to conquer yourself. Discipline living. But that's, once again, easier said than done. Right. So this is a quote from the book. Money, mas- money manifests itself as power. Sex is used to acquire both money and power. Power is frequently used to manipulate wealth. Wealth is just as frequently used to buy power. So I mean, it's just this never-ending um, tug-of-war. Yeah. Never-ending tug-of-war be- between these three things that just keep coming up and keep coming up. And if you live long enough, eventually you're going to fail a few times at this. <laughs> more than a few times and you're going to be faced with this and it's going to be something that, that, that keeps coming up um, that's from page two of the challenge of the discipline life I was supposed to bring it tonight so I could show you and I left it it's by Richard Foster that's his name Richard Foster um, another example that he gives in the book is from page five um, and he talks about the idiot by Dostoevsky okay and the idea is there's this guy Prince Mishkin Mishkin yes um, who is placed in this culture where everybody is obsessed with sex, money, and power. Everybody. I mean, so basically our culture, or any culture, right. really. The Greek culture did it, our culture does it. I mean, it's kind of a resounding thing in, pe- thing in people. But he is a person who doesn't have pride, greed, malice, envy, vanity, or fear. And he's placed into this. And the idea of it is that he's the idiot, Right? But then throughout the whole book, it kind of brings up the question, well, is he the idiot, or is it the society, or is the society the idiot for chasing these three things, like it's going to give them complete satisfaction? See what I mean? And so at the end of the book, you're kind of not really left with an answer so much as a question. And then it challenges you more of, what am I doing and where am I going? Right. 
do I align myself with the idiot or with this culture? See what I mean? Uh. And it completely challenges the way that the way that you you think about it. What to do with the person who had no desire for possessions? Think about that for a second. No desire for possessions. Our world thrives on on people's desire uh-huh. for possessions. See what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's the whole selling point on commercials. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Get this thing, you'll be happy. Right. So you buy the thing, right? That's the whole idea of capitalism. Uh-huh. See what I mean? Uh, no craving for sexual conquest. Well, if that was if that was a true thing in our culture, there would be no porn industry. Uh-huh. See what I mean? Like that's definitely a thing. No need for domination. Um, and the thing is, is a lot of these things have actually mixed themselves together. Um, in Fifty Shades of Grey, um, is an is a is an example of how the things have mixed. Power is united with sex in one story. See what I mean? And now it no longer becomes a story about sex or a story about power. The two are what is it called? In, inexcusably or um, inexplicitly? How does the word? Um, they're interlinked, where you can't just tear them apart. Right. See what I mean? And as you go through the go through the story of of, of sexual domination and whatnot, you 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 come you come to this thing, you come to this question of is this a healthy thing or is this not a healthy thing? Um, just so we're clear, I have not read the book or watched the movie. <laughs> I just know what it's about. Okay. Um, of course, the real question through the, throughout the novel is who really is the idiot? Perhaps the truthful is the person whose life is dominated by greed and power and sexual conquest. See? She kind of changes the, the setup there. So, how has the church dealt with this throughout history? Well, we're going to look at that uh, twofold. Okay, one is the monastic re- re- resolution, how, how, how the monks are going to resolve it. And then the other one is how are the Puritans going to resolve it. Okay? And if you notice, they're going to be really strongly opposite in, in, in many ways. Um, but yeah, okay, so first off, money. Well, monks, or, or, the, or the Catholic monastic orders, I guess you could say, resolved this with the idea of poverty. They took a vow of poverty. They, they, they gave away their possessions and, and they lived where, where they didn't have things, right? Do you guys know know a lot about history or just a little? I'll try to just go by where you don't really need to know a whole lot, okay? I'll try to just exclude the things that aren't important. Um, basically, the idea of giving up all your possessions and, and living separate from, from the hunger of the world to always be drinking and never be satisfied. Um... In, in in ways this worked, but in ways it didn't, because they never really dealt with the issue. They just learned how to ignore the issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, because sometimes, sometimes <laughs> it's better to just ignore the issue than to face it. Right. It's like an alcoholic going back into a bar and saying, "I have to conquer this." Right. Nah. See so, what I mean? Sometimes it's better to just ignore the problem. Right. Yeah. Um. So there, there, there is that. But the thing is, is that assumes that money is always going to be bad. It's inherently bad, and there's nothing you can do good with money or with possessions. Mm-hmm. And I would disagree with that. So, I mean, I think there are good things you can do with money and with your possessions. Um, and not to be naive, but we'll look at that later. Um, and so then, what about the Puritans? How did they address that? Well, the Puritans looked at it as all things are sacred. They looked at it as money's not necessarily bad, but it is sacred to the Lord. So, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so everything that, it, that the Puritans did kind of had this element of it all had to be sacred to the Lord. It all had to be special to the Lord. It, it all had to be done as to the Lord. Um, and they, that, that's where they got the idea of working as unto God. When you had a job, you were literally working for God. You know what I mean? When you had money, you were li- it was literally a gifted to you, especially by God, that exact amount for whatever reason. See what I mean? Um, uh, and so they kind of had the idea of using money but not serving it. Okay, so as you can see, there the monks and the Puritans handled it different. way yeah. differently. So then that takes us to the idea of sex. How did they handle it differently? Huh. Once again, huh. as monks do on huh. these things, ignore it. Uh-huh. Chastity, no to sexual relationships, no to sexuality at all. See what I mean? Which was a good thing and a bad thing. It's good in some way. We're going to talk about this later. Is it okay to not be married? We're going to talk about that later. But um, one thing about that is sexuality isn't a bad thing. Even outside of marriage, sexuality isn't a bad thing. And I'll explain what I mean when we get to sexuality. But what the monks tried to do is they had, they tried to suppress the fact that we are in fact human. You know what I mean? And 
as, although it looks really good on paper, it never really plays out like that. You know what I mean? Um, with sexuality, you can't just turn yourself off. Zach, you are a man. Gracie, you are a woman. Chuck, you are a man. See what I mean? Nothing you do can take that away because that, that's who you are. It's part of your sexuality as, as a human, mm-hmm. which God created. Do you know what I mean? And God didn't create something wrong. He, he created it and, and he said this is a good thing. You know what I mean? So obviously sexuality is not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself. Um, so I think that this one kind of went a little bit too over extreme. Huh. I'm not saying it, it, it's not okay to, to not marry. I'm not saying that. But I am saying to then say no to everything with your sexuality, it, it yeah, might be a little bit overboard. You know what I mean? So, um, denial is, is scriptural. I normally want to get into that, though, um, into the whole marriage thing. But I'll, I'll, I'll look at this in a different light. Denial is scriptural in another way, not just with sex, but, but with life in general. We're called to a life of, of, of self-discipline. You know what I mean? We can't just indulge in anything, right? Not just sex, everything in life. We can't indulge in money, you know what I mean? We can't indulge in, in uh, you know, all these different things that, that, that seeking to satisfy us. We have to indulge in the Lord, right? We have to self-discipline. So, um, then the Puritans looked at it once again, drastically different. Mm-hmm. Their, their solution was that marriage was companionship. And therefore, the issue to sex was just faithfulness. Staying with your partner. That, that was their resolution. Um, I have a feeling that's going to be pretty. Um, and, and so once again, you kind of have two polar opposites here. Monks are going to say, no, hey, no sex whatsoever. Whereas Puritans are going to go to the other extreme and say, okay. Well, not the other extreme, but but a whole, I'll go a whole different route and say, okay. Sex is okay, but it has to be in, the, in that faithfulness, in the, in the confines of a companionship. And sex is just another way that that companionship works itself forward. See what I mean? Uh, in fact, Puritans, um, I was reading in the book, and it was talking about how a lot of times people think that Puritans were real, you know, um, what is it called? Um, taboo about sexual things? Huh. Nope. <laughs> That's actually just an urban myth. They actually were very sexual religiously. You know what I mean? Um, not, I mean, and I don't mean in, in, a, in a social setting, but I mean, um, they were, it was, a, it was a, uh, a sect of Christianity, if you want to call it that that definitely did embrace human sexuality. Um, a lot different than I always grew up believing. But anyways, um, and, the, 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 and then the third, um, the, the third realm there, power. How the Catholics dealt with this, Catholics, how the monks dealt with this, is the idea of obedience. Um, you dealt the problem of power by just simply taking a vow of obedience, where you would serve other people. Now, this actually is still, I mean, is still used in, in a lot more than just the monastic communities nowadays. I mean, this is used in... I mean, even even in our church, pastors talked about this a hundred times. Rather than wanting to be served, serve. I mean, I've heard a bunch of pastors in America talk about this. Um, but anyways, um, so service takes the place of power. But the Puritan response was instead of that, order. See what I mean? Where power wasn't necessarily the wrong thing, it just had to be orderly. See what I mean? So, like, instead of one person who is the head and, 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 and a um, tyranny over somebody, had tyranny over somebody, a dictator over somebody, um, instead had the idea of mutual um, uh, power in the church. So everybody kind of had a voice for the purpose of, of, of um, uh, love and good works, kind of encouraging people into love and good works. But obviously, historically, we know what happened from that, don't we? The Salem Witch Trials, right? And it maybe didn't work out so great, right? But the idea is still still good, though, in, in parts, right? But here's the thing, though, with, with the power is, I don't think, and neither, I, I side with the author of the book that we're looking at, The Challenge of the Discipline Life. I don't think either of those solutions are good enough. I don't think that's good enough to just take the vow of obedience where you say, okay, service in the place of power. I don't think it's good enough to just simply say, order. Have power with order. There definitely has to be, I think, more of a balance. Um, and, and that leads me to my final point there. Authority and power must be in balance. Um, authority and submission has to be in balance. Authority and... See what I mean? Where... I'll give you the example of a parent and a child. Is the parent the head of the household? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, right? And, and they have, it's their job to train the child, right? Mm-hmm. But the child doesn't have to be completely submissive, right? Where they just roll on the ground and, you know, the, the parent chews up the food in their mouth and spits it into their mouth, right? No, we don't do that, right? We're training our children 
how to make decisions for themselves, right? right? Right. So that when we're gone, they'll be able to make their own decisions. When they move out, they'll be able to make their own decisions. Uh -huh. It'd be a contribution to society, right? Uh -huh. That right. sounds like a good idea, right? Right. So once again, author your authority, you don't domineer over your child, but at the same time, your child doesn't seek to get out of the bondage of submission, right? Until they're an adult, and then it's right. natural for them to get up and go, right? Right. See what I mean? So once again, I think that it has to be kind of kind of more of a balance um, between authority and submission. Okay. So, um, one thing that I think is important, I talked about sex. Um, our culture defines our lives, and one way that they've done that is by saying that it is scary to be alone. And if you don't get married, or if you don't have a girlfriend, or whatever, you're somehow less of a person, or you're empty. And if you don't have sex, that's not okay. It, it, it's not only something to ridicule, but it's something that's going to make you f not enjoy life to its fullest. That's what our culture tells us all the time, right? And even if you look at people who, who get divorced, then they instantly try and get right back into another relationship, right? Yeah. Usually. I mean, it takes them some time, right? They, they go through the healing process, and then they, they go right back into another relationship, right? I know a lot of people who got divorced, and they've been in, had, had multiple people that they dated, multiple people that they remarried. See what I mean? And it never really resolved the issue, did it? Uh -huh. See what I mean? Because our culture is wrong, it's okay to be alone. Yeah. It's okay. Not all of us were meant to get married. See what I mean? Now, obviously, I think there's a problem when you're a recluse. You don't have any friends. It's just you, and you only take care of yourself, and you don't go to church. You don't spend time with people. You don't. It's just you and yourself, and that's it. I think that's a problem. But as far as being married, not necessarily a problem. So, I mean, our culture tells us that we need these things to be more of a person. But the truth is, having kids is not going to make you feel like more of a person. It will distract you from your emptiness. Getting married or having a girlfriend or having sex isn't going to make you feel like more of a person either. It's just simply something else that's going to distract you for a while. And in fact, the more people you have sex with, the emptier you're, you're going to feel. See what I mean? Yeah. Because like Jesus said a long time ago, and we'll talk about this more later, when you have sex with someone, you bind yourself to that person. A part of you is with that person. So then to just walk away from that binding process is literally to cut yourself in half and you do yourself harm. See you know what I mean? Because how the Bible talks about sex, it never talks about it in terms of in terms of one and done. It talks about it in the sense of the instant that you have sex with someone, you're instantly bonded. And you can't return back from that state ever. And that's why Jesus says, I know this is hyperbole, but just roll with me. And that's why Jesus says, when you divorce someone and marry another, you are not an adulterer and you make her an adulterer. Because just because you're not legally bound to that person anymore doesn't mean that you're forever. See, I mean, you're still bounded together no matter what the law says. See what I mean? And so when you have sex with another person, see what I mean? You see what it, what's, been, what's happened? That person, you're not going to recover from that. See what I mean? The only exception to this that I've found is when it dissolves naturally in the process of death. Okay, But once again, oftentimes people still can't move on. And like I said when we were talking about dealing with loss, there's still that part that will never be fulfilled again. But I think, my own belief, is that, that as Christians, when we lose our partners like that, uh, through the process of death, that um, God has a way of bringing by someone else, if that is in fact the correct direction of, of that you should be going, um, that is able to um, to naturally just mesh. And the reason for that, I believe, is that a upon death, just kind of, it's no longer like this anymore, it's more of like, that. that's open again. You know what I mean? The person's still with you, but it's just, you're open again. You know what I mean? Does that kind of make sense? It's kind of a kind of a concept that is kind of hard to explain what I'm thinking. I was so I was hoping that using my hands would work. <laughs> I don't know if it did or not. Anyways, um, and w another example is this: is the divorce extremes that have happened throughout history. Judaism went to one extreme. A man could divorce a woman literally for any reason. I mean, goodness sakes, any reason. If she tied her if she tied her shoes wrong or whatever, it just upset you that day. That's just it. You give her you give her the the sign of divorce. That's just it. Um, but then the medieval church took it to the whole other extreme, right? They said, no divorce whatsoever. If you commit divorce for any reason, doesn't matter what, you are the world's biggest sinner. 
and you know the church all the church is going to look down on you see what I mean so they kind of went from one extreme to the other didn't they see what I mean Aww. so um, are there reasons for divorce we'll look at that in the future um, and the reason why people do this is because extremes are the best way to ensure perfection if you want your underlings to be exactly under your control, expect, ex I mean, go to extreme about something. Because then you have everything under control. Like the Pharisees? Exactly. The Pharisees did it. The uh, popes did it. Um, uh, there's rumor that Mark Driscoll did it. I don't know if he actually did or not. I don't know. But there's rumor that he did. Uh, and people have done this throughout the, throughout the church's history. The, this idea, of, this idea of, of controlling the masses through extremism. See what I mean? Oh, it's absolutely positively wrong in any reason for divorce. This way I'll keep my people from getting divorced and they'll grow more spiritually. See what I mean? The Pharisees did the same thing. They tried to build walls around the law, uh, putting laws on top of laws so that if you felled their laws, at least you wouldn't have felled God's laws. See what I mean? Uh, Trying to attain perfection through the process of extremism. Uh, the problem is, perfection isn't attainable. And rather than just learning how to deal with that messiness, a lot of people try to control that messiness. Um, but then that brings us to the final point of, of these different res uh, ideas of resolution. All things must have boundaries. And these boundaries is, are called discipline. Right? Are video games get bad? No. These need to be controlled. Uh -huh. Right? We shouldn't go every single day of the week for three hours and play Minecraft. Nothing but Minecraft. You really shouldn't. You really shouldn't. <laughs> For goodness sakes, play NBA or something. Madden, I don't know, just anything besides Minecraft all day, every day. That should be a sin. If I write a book of the Bible and it's accepted as canon, that's going to be verse 1. Thou shalt not play video games Monday through Friday, 3 to 6, every single day. <laughs> Anyways. Can you tell that I have Oasis tomorrow? <laughs> um, okay, so everything just has to simply have boundaries, which is called discipline. And the why do they have to have boundaries is the purpose. So we have to live with discipline and purpose. And we'll talk more about this later. I'm just trying to kind of introduce these concepts. And what are the effects of having a disciplined lifestyle because of, of your purpose? What are the effects of that? Well, we're going to look at that too. Um, any questions before I move on to the final, to the final thing that we're getting up to? No? Okay. Um, so, okay. The dark side. <laughs> To everything, there's a light side and a dark side. <laughs> and I mean everything. Money, sex, uh -huh. power. There's a light side and there's a dark side. A right way to use it and a bad, bad way to use it. An example of this would be uh, Batman, right? The Dark Knight, right? Uh -huh. Everybody knows about this, right? Uh -huh. um, he wants to learn about justice. He wants to learn about these different things, right? So he goes out and he studies with, um, oh, what is his name? Um, played by Liam Neeson in, in, in the first Batman movie, the, not the first one, but the first of the three that came out a few years ago. Uh, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Um, oh. oh, I can't remember what his character's name was. Um, ben, can you look that up? Do you have your phone out? Mm -hmm. Can you look up what Liam ne Neeson's character was called in Batman? Um, but anyways, and he studies with him, and it eventually comes down to this. To achieve justice, we have to kill all the people in Gotham City because they've all messed up, mm. right? So then Batman goes to the other side and says, oh, okay, hold on. Maybe a little more balanced justice. I'll use fears to scare people, but I'm not going to kill people. All right. You know what I mean? Kind of a little bit more balance. I'm not necessarily saying Batman is, is who we should be acting like. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay? okay? I'm just saying that, that there's a light side and a dark side. Um, Ra's al Ghul. Oh, Never mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ra's al Ghul. Yeah. Ra's al Ghul takes it to one side. You know, you have to kill everybody. And then Batman takes it to the other side and says, okay, well, maybe we could just achieve justice another way. The dark side and the light side. Yeah. So the three things can enhance life or destroy it. Money can enslave you. You can have, you, everything can be about greed, what you can attain, rank, position, everything can be about greed for you. Or you can use money for good things, right? Carrie Malden just came to our church a few weeks ago, and we gave him money to build churches and that kind of stuff, right? Is that bad? No. Well, no, it's not bad. That's a good thing. Churches are going to be built. People are going to have a place to gather under in bad weather because, uh, because of people giving. You can't honestly tell me that's bad. That's a good thing. Whereas, okay, sex. 
Sex has the ability of unifying two people in a great bond, and it also has the possibility of ripping you apart from your soul. Do you know what I mean? It has the ability to, to link you with someone that then you don't stay faithful to, and you are forever hurt because of it. So you know I mean? It has the potential for both. Power. Power can be used for good, can it? Would you say God has power? Well, so evidently power can't be all bad, right? What about um, when a when a parent uses their power to uh, prevent their child from touching the stove? Well, that's a good use of power, right? Mm -hmm. As compared to Hillary Clinton, who lies about everything and has more controversy surrounding her than flies around a turd. See what I mean? Uh -huh. Like... <gasps> A good example of good power versus bad power. You see what I'm saying? So not everything is all bad. The three things can enhance life or completely destroy it. So you really have to be on guard about it. Money, not, not necessarily a bad thing. Greed, turned bad. Trying to profit even in giving. I'm going to give tithes, but I better get something out of it. Well, it's because those blessings can match you. Know? Right? Yeah. Exactly. See what I mean? Like, where you're giving... But it's not resolving the issue, right? Because you oh. are greedy, right? right? See what I'm getting at? Sex. Well, okay, sex is good, right? So lust is good, right? In fact, a lot of people do this. They get married because of lust, not love. Right? Has nothing to do with love. Because love has to do with this. How can I profit this person until they die? See what I mean? Whereas people go into marriage with something else, don't they? What can I get out of this? Will they make me feel... Will I be able to do this? See what I mean? A lot of times people think they're getting married because of love, but it's actually lust. And uh, so once again, lust is the bad side. It's the shadow side, the dark side of it. Um, or not loving the person, but wanting to possess the person. Wanting to domineer the person wanting to control them see what I mean not accepting them possessing them not loving them holding them see what I mean loving is where you accept somebody for who they are Lo domineering is where you're trying to change them into what you want them to be see what I mean oftentimes I hear people who are going to get married and, and, and the women especially the women say this I'll work on that when they were talking about the man's bad attributes, oh, I'll get him to change that. I'll work on that. Hate to tell you, but he's probably going to be at least as stubborn as you, if not more. Why do you think this is going to happen? Bad idea. See what I mean? But once again, marrying out of lust, not out of love. Power. What's the, what's the dark side of power? Pride. Right? Because if we have no pride, we have nothing to prove, and, and we'll, we'll reign in power with... Wisdom, right? For the most part. There's other things that need to be like love and mercy and justice and that kind of stuff. But pride is really the thing that pushes power into the dark realm. You know what I mean? Because it, it makes things personal. And it, make, it makes things more of, um, well, domineering. I, mean, I don't know of any other way. It becomes manipulation, domination, tyranny. This is exactly what happened in Jonestown, wasn't it? Was the idea of Jonestown necessarily bad? A self-sustaining community. No, not necessarily bad, anything bad there. Was the idea of Jonestown before they became Jonestown a bad idea, when they were still living outside of the city, growing their crops? No, that's not a bad idea either. Get poor people one night, you unite them together, where they're working for themselves for a common goal. That's not necessarily a bad thing either, is it? But it got up pretty ugly pretty bad, didn't it? See what I mean? Because power became prideful. It was governed by manipulation, domination, and tyranny. See what I mean? So there's a dark side to all, to all three of the things, but... There's also light sides to these two things. So, um, one thing that's impor important to re realize is that it is impossible to be objective toward them. You can try and think about money objectively. Oh, money isn't bad, and I just have to make sure that uh, I don't let it own me. And then all of a sudden it doesn't work out like that. Why? Because you let your guard down because you think that there's nothing, nothing wrong with it because you're thinking objectively about it. But you can't think about money objectively. The reason why, according to Richard Foster, is because the money itself is a power that comes against you. And my theory 
It's because there are some things in the world that are like keys to doors. And when you hold those keys, it opens doors whether you wanted them open or not. See what I mean? It's like the key has a mind of its own. Uh And it kind of plays with you. See what I mean? I think that that's the dark side of ourselves that dwell in each one of us. Richard Foster thinks that it's the thing itself, the money itself, that has that power to it. Whichever view you take, whatever. If you want more on his view, I would encourage you to read the book. He explains it a lot better. Um, So anyways, it is impossible to be objective about these things. Sex, it is impossible to look at, at, at sex objectively. It's just stupid. You can't do that. It will have dominion over your life if you let it. So I mean, you have to look at it as something that has to be dealt with. It is a key that will open that door. Okay, uh, power. It is something that is not objective. It is not objective because it, we're not just talking about the power. We're talking about the power that goes with the person. And whenever the equation changes like that, the outcome changes. Um, so you will eventually be their slave. And what people need to see is joyful, confident, obedient living. People need to see that in us. They need to see something different. But we can't just put on an air of that, can we? It has to be genuine, right? So how did we make that genuine? We'll look at that starting next week. Um, So we're going to be living purposeful. We're going to be living disciplined. Um, And that itself is is a profit to not just us, but to other people. Um, And we must learn how to master these things. Um, so that when the times of testing comes, we have answers for them. Okay? The question of the week is the same as it was last week. How do you overcome greed? I want you guys to actually wrestle with this question, please. Think very, very deeply about this. And Gracie, you've already given an answer, and Zach, you've kind of you kind of thought about some answers too. Uh-huh. Yeah, I want you guys to take your take your views and, and think about them more. Think them through deeper. You know, push them as far as they can go. Really uh, question yourself. Try to look at it someone else and say, am I wrong? Is there a way to be wrong? Argue against yourself to see, you know, really delve into the question. I want you guys to seriously think about this. And Ben and Chuck, by all means, um, I'm not trying to exempt you guys from that. <laughs> but anyways. Um, okay. So, um, are there any questions? <laughs>